it comes to the invisible works of the Spirit, which is what we're talking about this weekend, the supernatural aspects of the Christian life, I don't know that if there is any subject about which Christians have a more complicated opinion. I'll say that. I like that, that phrasing. A complicated opinion. Because no Christian can deny that the Bible is just replete with stories of miraculous healing. They're everywhere. It's one of the things that you learn as a young Christian, as a baby growing up in church, that Jesus walked on water and opened the eyes of the blind and healed the lepers, and we, we love all those stories. However, there are many people in the church, and also certainly outside of the church, who deny the possibility of such things today. Now, this, isn't, this is not for today. Healing was something Jesus and the apostles did to affirm the message. Now that the message has been affirmed, we don't need it any longer. But this is what complicates it. Even if you have such a position, you cannot deny that we hear stories of miracles all the time. Whether from our own church or from our own life or from other denominations, they're out there. At the very least, folks have to begrudgingly admit, okay, well, on the missions field, this kind of thing seems to happen quite a bit. So where this leaves us is a place of not really believing this, but also I can't quite deny this, you know what I mean? So... There will be people who will formally ask God for help, ask God for healing, ask for a miracle. It's pretty plain from the Bible you ought to pray for healing. But still having a, a disbelief that something will happen. Many people use this, this phrase. I want to put God in a box. Well, good, don't do that. But they, they fail to recognize that God himself has de described and defined what he will do. So there are a lot of churches that don't really believe in healing. They won't teach on healing, and they even kind of discourage some of the testimonies, yet they'll still pray for one another because prayer still feels safe. And if God does something, then we'll be excited about it. Other churches see healings all the time, so much so that you start to get a little suspicious of their testimony. You know, I had the sniffles, and I prayed in Jesus' name, and those sniffles just snorted right out of my nose and never heard it again. And sometimes the, the description of the healing, if you listen closely, nothing really happened, but we're trying to make it sound like something did. You've heard those testimonies before. It's like, you know, we asked for the Lord to heal my back, and, you know, my back still hurts, but I just have, I have more confidence and joy than ever before. It's like, well, that's wonderful, but that's not healing, that's, that's encouragement, that's biblical too, but that wasn't healing. There's some that feel compelled and pressured to describe everything that happened to them as a miracle. And for this reason, some people start to doubt their testimonies. All I can say is that I want to hear what the Bible has to say about it. And the Bible, when we talk about healing, you guys, it gives us plenty to talk about today. We're going to actually start by just being inundated with scripture related to healing. And I'm not going to get cute with the definition of healing here. I mean healing just like you think, that somebody was sick or broken or disabled in some way, and then God touched their life, and now they're not. The cancer is gone. They're able to get out of that wheelchair. This affliction has vanished, and the doctor doesn't know why. That's what I mean when I say healing. There are all sorts of moral and spiritual applications we can draw from the stories of healing in the Bible, but I'm talking about the act itself of healing. And, you know, my whole life I've believed these things, and I had the sort of personality that is, is sort, of like a, sort of like a terrier, I guess. It kind of grabs hold of your, your pant leg and won't let go, and it's like, would you get off me? That's kind of how I am with some things. Like, listen, I believe this, so where is it? That's been my whole, my whole life has been like that, and I think the Lord can use it for his glory. It's like, okay, well, you've been healed. What was it like? I cannot tell you how many times I've asked that question to people. Okay, so you knew a guy that had the gift of healing. Tell me about him. You know, or, okay, God healed you. What was that like? And gathering these stories and learning. I have even, you know, God forbid, gone outside the bounds of Calvary Chapel and even outside the bounds of what I would consider to be sound doctrine, to gain testimonies and instruction from people that see these things. Y'all, if you want to learn about healing, you've got to talk to the people that are seeing healings. There are certain people that I have learned from that I wouldn't even stand in this pulpit and affirm them for you, because they're wacky on so many things. But you cannot deny that they love Jesus, they're certainly saved, and God is using them in this way. And now I can also say that through the wisdom I have gained in my own life, I think that there's a lot I have to say, and there's much to be excited. God healed three people last night, you guys. 
I mean, I'm, I'm dead serious. If you missed the afterglow, guys, you missed it. Because the Lord was really working on people's bodies, not just their hearts. And every one of them was different. Because as we're going to see, it's always different when the Lord is there. Because we're all different. And God is not a science formula. Right? God is a person. He is actually persons. So let's talk about what the Bible has to say about this. I hope you can get excited and, and just and to let yourself be excited. You know what I mean? Like you're so we're, I know we're afraid of aberrance and okay, but we don't have any of that here. Okay. So let's just allow ourselves to get excited. We've got a God that touches the body and heals the sick. Okay. In the old Testament, you see various healings of the body, but it, I wouldn't say that it's a major theme in the old Testament. You see, especially in the lives of Elijah and Elisha, you see a lot of really cool ministry. Elijah raised somebody from the dead, which is pretty cool. You know, you and I might turn to the, the widow and comfort her with the comfort of the hope of heaven. Elijah said, I'm going to go and pray for this kid to come back to life. Elisha had many miracles. We know about Naaman, who was leprous, and he jumped in the water seven times and was healed. Elisha raised somebody from the dead after he died. Like somebody fell into his grave and touched his bones and blah! And they came back. So that's, I'm, that's a, how do you ever talk about anything else for the rest of your life after that happens? It's like, yeah, that is great. But you know what happened this one time? You know, I died. And, uh, and then they dropped me in the, you know. But it's really the ministry of Jesus that was marked by miraculous healing and exorcism, casting out of demons. We tend to separate those two things, and the Bible does too, but it talks about them together more than it talks about them separately. So let's look at a, a ton of scripture together. And I said we'd start with Matthew 8, 16. It says, That evening they brought to Jesus many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. We don't read of people coming to Jesus and walking away without being healed. I say, well, that's Jesus. Yes, but remember, Jesus is our example, and we have the same Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Now, it is absolutely true and must be said that the signs of Jesus were inferior to the message of Jesus. There were even times Jesus would pull back from the miraculous ministry because it was preventing him from teaching his word. But that should never be our excuse to say, therefore, we're going to preach the word and not worry about the rest of this. Jesus' ministry as a healer was crucial to his story. Even those those godless skeptics in the Jesus seminar, when they were trying to sort out what was legitimate about the testimony of Jesus and what was not, many of them had to grudgingly admit, it sure seems like Jesus was a healer. He had a reputation as a healer and a faith, you know, faith healer. Well, I don't think it was just his reputation. We believe it was the truth. While Jesus was still alive, he sent out his own disciples. At one point, he sent out the 12, and then he sent out 72 to go out and tell Israel that the Messiah had come. And when he did that, he empowered them to do the same kinds of signs he was doing. That's important. It's going to come back later. But in Matthew 10, verses 7 and 8, Jesus told them what to do. He said, Proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist said that. Jesus said that. Now the disciples are saying that. He also said, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. That was part of it. Preach the message, and in order to affirm the message, heal people, cast out demons, raise the dead, he said. It's amazing that that's, a, that's an imperative in Scripture, raise the dead. Also a little thing there. Some people really get weird. Say, well, people don't heal anybody. God heals people. Okay, the Bible does not quibble over that terminology, okay? It says, you go heal the sick. The disciples' power over sickness and over the devils was a sign that the kingdom of God was at hand. The sign that everything that had been prophesied in the Old Testament was about to come true was confirmed by the miraculous works that the disciples did. And would you believe that when Jesus commissioned the church after his resurrection, he gave them the same mandate. And in fact, you are intended to read the mandate he gave to them before the Great Commission as applying to you. We'll do this little shake and bake when we read those passages, right? He says, watch out for they'll cast you out of the synagogues and you'll be beaten for my namesake. And we apply that Christians must be prepared to suffer. And he says, heal the sick, cleanse the leper. Ah, that's not for you. That was just for the apostles. Well, then why is it in there? 
You know, Mark 16, this is after the resurrection. Jesus said, these signs will accompany those who believe. Will accompany who? Those who believe. Rave your hand if you believe. Okay, he's prophesying about you. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. And this is exactly what you see in the book of Acts. That the church went out and as they went out, amazing signs and wonders followed them. Especially laying hands on the sick and watching them recover. This was done especially through the apostles, but if you read your Bible closely, as you must, it was not done exclusively through the apostles. This is something, another little shake and bake we try to do. Well, yeah, the apostles, but not the rest of us. Well, that's not even what happened in the book of Acts. But it was especially the apostles. There's two cool stories I want to read you. One comes from Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's portico, which was a part of the outer court of the temple where people would meet. None of the rest dared join them because Ananias and Sapphira had just been struck dead, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. You cannot deny that a a crucial piece of the early church ministry was the healing of the sick. You know, if you just get in Peter's shadow, that's enough and you'll be healed. What kind of faith is that, man? We talked about faith yesterday. If faith is tied to what you see, if you scoff at something like that, you lack faith. Well, here's another one, though. Acts 19, verses 11 through 12. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Don't you love that they had, like, rankings of miracles? (laughs) They had, like, the regular plain old miracles and then the stuff Paul does. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Can you imagine Paul's making tents, right? And he's got a sweat rag and he kind of wipes it off and tosses it to the side. And then there's somebody like waiting and they run up and they steal his rag. He goes, hey, get back with that. And off they go. And they come home and mama's got a demon. (laughs) You know, and she's just, you know, screaming and screeching because she's got this demon. And says, here, and he throws the rag on her head and she shrieks, ah, and this demon comes screaming out of her and she's better. That's the kind of stuff God was doing with Paul, right? Stealing his sweatbands. You can see that the early church had a robust and regular ministry of healing, especially through certain individuals. Now, why is that? Because as we read last night in John 14, the church is to be the continuation of Jesus Christ's ministry. He said, you will do the works that I did and greater works than these will you do because I am going to the Father. And whatever you ask me in my name, I will do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. It's exactly what we see in the book of Acts. It's a problem that in the church we say the book of Acts should be our example in everything except for this. We'll hear this. I've been in, I went to a great university, but they were very shy in this Christian school, about the ministry of healing. They were not deniers of the ministry of healing, but my Book of Acts professor straight up told us, you know, the Book of Acts is something that we ought to imitate, and that's our standard for life, but I do not know that we can say the supernatural aspects are something for us to imitate or to desire, because that was a special time, you know. But do we have biblical reason to say that it's a special time? I'm not denying that it was special, but it was it unique in the sense that It's not to be repeated ever again. I'm not denying that the apostles were special. I'm not denying that this was a worldwide revival that God was doing. But is there anywhere in the Bible that tells us that we ought to expect the ministry of healing to continue? Yes, there is. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. Kind of hard to wiggle out of this one. The brother of Jesus himself who was the skeptic in the Gospel of John, by the way. If you read it closely, it seems like James may have even 
separated from Jesus and kicked Mary out of his house. Otherwise, why is Jesus telling John the evangelist to take care of his mother? But James came around and he wrote a pretty intense epistle. And here's what he says. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Notice the connection there. We'll come back to that. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I have heard and preached, don't get me wrong here, that passage talked about over and over again, confess your sins that you may be healed spiritually, that you'll feel better, that the devil won't have a hold on you anymore. That's true, but when he says healed, he means healed. The power, or sorry, the prayer of a righteous man has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. James is telling us the life of Elijah is what you as a Christian ought to expect. That when someone's sick, what do we do as Christians? We come and pray for them that they'll be healed. James tells us to pray and ask for healing, not from the heroes of the faith, but from people who have a nature just like ours. Don't you love James? There's nothing so special about Elijah. That really fits with the tone of his whole epistle, doesn't it? This demonstrates to us we cannot relegate healing to a previous dispensation. This is now. This is for right now. That the ministry of healing ought to continue to the present day and, in fact, until our Lord returns. That being said, there's another piece of, t of teaching we get that there are certain people that God gifts in this way more than others in the church, which is exactly what we should expect. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. That the Lord has appointed for the church healers. Somebody say, cool. cool. That's pretty awesome. God has appointed there, just like he has appointed there to be prophets and teachers in the church and helpers and administrators in the church, he has appointed healers for the church. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 30 reminds us that not everybody has that gift, just as not everybody has any gift. We all have different gifts uses of the Holy Spirit's power in our life. However, some people do. And it is a very special thing. We're all told to pray for the sick. But there are certain people that God gives a special endowment of power to lay hands on the sick. The Bible teaches us that the supernatural gifts of the Spirit would increase in the last days, not decrease. We should expect to see more healing as the day approaches, not less of it. And yes, there are times of revival where these things just explode. And Pastor Joel is going to talk about that on Sunday. But it is in Christ Jesus that we learn these things. If we're going to continue the ministry of Jesus, healing has to be a part of it. Because it was such a huge piece of what he did. Both the gift of healing and also the access to healing through prayer. And not only is this something that the Bible says we should expect and enjoy, the Bible says something pretty serious about healing. And I am going to teach this. There are some that take this way too far, but I'm going to teach it because it's in the Bible anyway, okay? Matthew 8, 17. We read this verse earlier, verse 16, where it said he cast out the sick and he laid hands on them and they were all healed. Matthew tells us this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Do you know where he is quoting from right there? He's quoting from Isaiah 53. When he says, who has believed our report? Right? That he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, he opened not its mouth. That by his stripes we are healed. It's all about the cross and Jesus as a sacrificial lamb. Now you can just skip over this if you're just reading Isaiah. Where it also says he, he bore our infirmities. But Matthew and the other apostles understood that part of the fulfillment of Jesus' work on the cross was healing of the body. 
Now, there are some that will say, if you believe in Jesus, you should never be sick. And if you do, then you're not really saved. Like, that's messed up and crazy, all right? Let the rest of the Bible interpret what this means. However, you cannot deny that in some way, the healing of the body is tied to the atonement that Jesus won on the cross. That's not me saying that. That's Matthew and Isaiah saying that. And I'm not going to pretend that I understand all of that. I'm just going to say it's in your Bible. It's so easy to spiritualize the passages about healing. And they'll, they'll preach, man, for real. You know, leprosy is a great symbol in the Bible of sin. But we should not forget that Jesus actually healed lepers. Yeah, Jesus raised the dead. And we're, we're all going to rise from the dead in Christ. And you can have new life in Christ. Man, even Paul makes that analogy. But Jesus actually raised people from the dead. We can't miss that. I was told by somebody one time, good friend, uh, not a Calvary Chapel guy, but sometimes you need people that are not from your tribe to, to encourage you and remind you, right? But he said, you know, it's a shame that so many pastors come to the passages where Jesus healed people, and the lesson is about everything except healing for people. And I'm like, that convicts me a little bit. So I, I try to make sure that when we talk about these things, whatever other illustrations we're going to draw, whatever other applications, I should say, uh, one of them is that you should come to Jesus and ask for him to heal your body. Now, that's the scripture right there, okay? That's, that's the big bag of scripture for you to take home and meditate and be a good Berean and, and search through. But here's, let's answer some objections now because some people argue, okay, fine, it's in the Bible, but we don't need it today. You ever heard that? We don't need it today. I've been told we don't need all kinds of things. Ranging from prophecy, we got the Bible, what do we need prophecy for? Gift of tongues, what do you need that for? Now we've already, people already know about the gospel. To healing, well, God has already given us doctors and everything, and if God was going to heal me, well, he'd just heal, heal me on, on his own. People try to think they're honoring God when they say things like that. Such people don't know the word. And if you've thought those things, I'll very kindly say to you, you don't know the word either. Why do we need healing? Well, there's lots of reasons the Bible gives us. I'm going to give you four. Number one, we need healing to glorify God. And specifically, be this not just like in some abstract sense, to demonstrate that this God is the real God. That our God is the true God. That there is a God in the universe who can heal and save. I've talked to Nanda, our pastor friend in Nepal. He's telling me one time about all the, just the insidious nature of Hinduism. And I uh, I go, how do you get somebody saved? I asked, how do you lead somebody to Jesus? How do you evangelize them? He goes, somebody's got to get healed. I said, really? He goes, oh, yeah, that's how everybody gets saved. And I said, what percentage would you say of people are in the Nepali church out of Hinduism because of miraculous healing? He said, 98%. Because they believe in all sorts of gods. But when you come across a God named Jesus Christ who can actually heal your body... So well, then forget these stupid idols, man. I'm going with him. And that's the purpose of healing. There was a woman I met in Nepal. She gave her testimony that there was an idol that they would offer food to. Every time before they ate, there was an idol sitting at the table. And they was, she, uh, she was a very energetic lady. She was so much fun. She's like, this is ugly, angry, right, the idol. And, you know, she, we'd, we'd have to put a piece of our food on the, on the altar first. Then we could eat. And she said her little girl ate some first. And she was afflicted and bent over like this. And she couldn't bend anymore. Like it, the, the demon that was in the idol cursed her. And they went to all kinds of doctors and all kinds of witch doctors and Western doctors. All of them, even the ones that had been trained in what we would call medicine today, told her, well, she's offended the gods. There's nothing I can do for her. So she said, so I went home and I cursed that idol to its face. And the demon then cursed her with Bell's palsy, which is when half your face droops. And she's telling the story. She's doing like this. She was a lot of fun. And she goes, but I didn't care because I would never worship or honor a God that would do that to my little girl. So my little girl is crippled. My face is like this. But then, she, then I heard the name of Jesus, and I heard that Jesus could heal people. And I said, will you pray for me? And will you pray for my daughter? And they were both instantly healed. So they took that idol and they chucked it in the garbage can because there's a true and living God. Do, do we not still need that testimony today in the United States of America? The second reason we need healing is to testify of the resurrection. The central fact of the Christian testimony is that Jesus has risen from the dead. You might say everything that happens in the church is to affirm and preserve that truth that Jesus rose from the dead. It is the miracle that we believe. 
Well, how are we supposed to know that? Now, there are the testimony of Scripture, obviously. There are great apologists like Gary Habermas who spend their life demonstrating through sound logic and reason and history that this has to be true. But the biblical way you know that Jesus is alive is that he heals folks. In Acts chapter 3, the man at the gate, beautiful. Silver and gold I do not have, but in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And this man goes into the temple leaping and dancing before the Lord. My legs never worked. I'm like, I got some leaping to do. I got to catch up on some things. And when they came out and they're looking at Peter and John, he goes, why are you looking at us like we through our own power or our own piety made this happen? He said, it is Jesus Christ who's risen from the dead. This is how you know that he's risen from the dead. The Pharisees were trying to spread all kinds of rumors and lies, but it's really hard to argue with a man that couldn't walk and now he can. That the same things that Jesus used to do are still happening because Jesus is still alive. Isn't that awesome? That we know he's alive because he's healing people. If people today are so skeptical of the resurrection, how are we going to convince them? Maybe we should pray for a little bit of the supernatural to confirm this in their life. Number three, we need healing to prove our forgiveness. How do I know that my sins have been forgiven? Well, the Bible gives us one way you can know. Do you remember the story where Jesus was preaching, and and it seems like this was Peter's house, and they started ripping up the roof? I think sometimes we forget how wild Jesus' ministry was, you know. He's sitting there preaching. They got Pharisees in the house, you know, and they start ripping up the roof while Jesus is talking. I bet you, you know, Peter's mother-in-law had something to say about that. But they start lowering this lame man down into the room, and Jesus goes up to him, and what does he say? He doesn't say, be healed. He says, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees start to do this thing right here. You know? And when you're a pastor, you always know when somebody disagrees with you because they lean over to their wife like this. <laughs> and you go, okay, noted. <laughs> but Jesus goes, what are you, hey, what are you whispering about? Don't you love Jesus, right? What are you whispering about? I'm like, whoa, what are you talking about? He goes, what, what's easier? Would it be easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? Obviously, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because nobody can double check, Right? It's easier to say that, but he goes, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Pick up your bed and walk. Matthew 9, verse 6. That was proof that your sins are forgiven. And y'all, when I was in Peru, this was, this was causing grown men to break down and cry in this meeting. Because I was talking about the, the forgiveness. The Wednesday night, I talked about the forgiveness that we have and the assurance of the ascension and how Jesus intercedes for us and you know, especially in that culture, which is so oppressed under the, the weight of the Catholicism that is just pressing down on people that there's, you've got a, the, the guilt, there's no grace, especially in South America. It's, it has nothing really to do even with Christ. It's about just beating people over the head with stuff. But when you come in and you tell them that there's grace, how, how can I ever see, how do I know? How can I be sure? Well, when the Lord reaches in and he heals your heart murmur, and he reaches over and he heals your kidneys, and he heals your neck, and he heals your cancer, and he heals your low blood pressure. Okay, I think I'm going to listen to this guy now. I think I'm going to believe this now. Proving our forgiveness. And the last reason, number four, that we need healing is to show Christ's love. Sometimes Jesus wants you to be healed because he likes you. It's okay to think that, guys. Sometimes we feel like we've got to get a business plan and present it to God. This is why I think I ought to be healed. And, you know, you got a little PowerPoint presentation. And, you know, this, is, uh, this would all be good for your kingdom and it'd be good for the kids. And God goes, hey, I, you know I like you, right? You know I love you. I just want to do a nice thing for you. There was a man in Uganda, Chris, who was there that uh, we were having an afterglow service. And the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. And I said, I think God wants to heal somebody's leg tonight. And he said, well, I haven't been able to sleep for six months because, you know, this leg pain, you know, it's in my hip and, you know, and, he starts to get a little emotional, and so did his wife. And we laid hands on him, y'all. He was healed instantly. And the next morning, he comes strutting out. because he's like, I feel great. It was wonderful. I slept all the way through the night for the first time since I can remember. And as we talked to him, what he said was, you know, my daughter has some very serious health concerns. And I didn't want to pray for this because I felt like, you know what, she's at the top of the list, okay? I said, but you know what the Lord reminded me is that he loves me too. I don't have to get in line with God, right? It just reminds us that God loves us. Are these not things we need today? How many, to use a biblical term, have suffered many things at the hands of the physicians? I know lots of people like that. i got some in my family that have suffered at the hands of physicians. Why don't we let God help? 
And we feel like, well, we don't want to get people's hopes up. Isn't that what we do too much? I don't want to get somebody's hopes up. That's exactly what we want. We're Christians, guys. Faith, hope, and love last forever. Get people's hopes up. Is God so stingy? Like, oh, how dare you put me on the spot like that? God kind of likes being put on the spot. There's a difference between testing God because you lack faith and just saying, all right, God, we got no hope but a miracle. He goes, let's go. I love it. So then let's get some practical stuff in here, guys. That, that's the theology behind it, the scripture behind it. How do we do this? How do we pray for the sick? Now, some people are like, well, there's, we really shouldn't have techniques related to this because it's all God's sovereign work. Guys, everything is God's sovereign work. Preaching is a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit, but you better believe that we got techniques that we use. Administration and service in the church are works of the sovereign Holy Spirit, but we've got techniques and we've got things that we learn. You do know you can get better at prayer, don't you? Let me testify that you're better at prayer now than you used to be. I sure can say that. So here's some steps that I have learned. Some of these I picked up from people. Some of this is just my own experience. So this is my wisdom as your pastor to you. Here's how we can pray for the sick more effectively. First thing, and this is, I think, the biggest one that I've learned. Slow down. Take your time. We are in no hurry. We are wrestling, not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers in many cases. And we've got to work out faith. So you can't be in a hurry. This is something that uh, many people do. Well, we'll pray for you real quick. And I don't mind quick prayers, but the, well, I'm talking about that serious intercession. Like, let's just chill out. Like I said last night, we were praying for Brandon. I said, guys, we're uh, in no hurry. We're going to pray. You might need to pray a couple times. There's no other appointment to get to. And if you don't feel like you have time for that, then say, you know what? Let's, why don't we do this tomorrow? Or cancel your appointment. Okay? <laughs> Now, here's the next thing. Ask for a little bit more information from this person about their affliction. What's wrong? Well, my back hurts. Okay, tell me a little more. What do you mean your back hurts? And ask for details. What's going on? Where does it hurt? Why do you think that it hurts? Because some people have, sometimes people have spiritual insight into what's going on with them. What did the doctor say? How long has this lasted? Push a little bit. Because not only are you trying to get information for our next step, you're trying to have a connection with this person. Let them talk about it. And sometimes people don't want to talk about it because it's hard and they've been balling up all of this feeling and all this pain and they, you know, they want prayer but they don't want to talk about it. But the minute you start to like, say what's going on, sometimes the tears start to flow, sometimes the anger starts to flow. Just an openness. And now it's like, okay, yeah, God can fix that. You know? Here's the next thing you should do. Try to discern in the spirit if there is something going on here that could be a key to prayer. Things like a hidden sin. I'll ask people sometimes, why do you think this is happening to you? Almost every time people say, I don't know, okay? But sometimes people will just say, well, I think I know what it is. And they'll share maybe a sin that they've been keeping secret. Or maybe they'll share, uh, you know, an event that happened to them that they haven't gotten over yet. Sometimes they'll share things that seem to you totally irrelevant, but there's a connection in the spirit. And sometimes God will give you those things too. Try to detect if there's a lack of faith there. When, when somebody just really kind of wants to get it over with, it's probably just, if you can't get them to accept that this is about to happen, maybe it is best just to get it over with. Say, okay, if you really don't feel like you have faith for this, we'll still pray for you, but, you know, I don't know if we're going to labor in prayer like we normally would. Just, just see. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Then you should lay hands on them when it is appropriate. As a rule, gentlemen and ladies, when you are praying for somebody of the opposite sex, have somebody else with you like your wife or your husband, and like shoulders is a good place to stop. All right? Laying a hand on the shoulder, lightly and gently. You don't need to be rubbing anybody's back, right? And even if it's something like, well, you know, you know my, my stomach hurts. What I'll do sometimes, you know, uh, we prayed for a woman in uh, Peru who had ovarian cysts. So what I had her do is I said, will you, you know, lay your hand on it and have your husband lay his hand there, and then we'll pray for you. That's appropriate, right? Wouldn't be appropriate for me to do that. Uh, you don't have to lay hands. It's not magic, but it is what the Bible says to do, right? Now, it also says that we should anoint with oil. Oil is a biblical symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's not magic, guys. It's not magic. I hear people say, you've got to get my miracle blessed oil and you'll heal any, any illness, right? And it's like, yeah, there is no such thing, guys, all right? It's not magic. It's a symbol. It's a reminder. It's a faith builder. It's a recognition of the Holy Spirit's power, Okay? 
So anointing with oil is totally appropriate. And then you should pray. Don't beg, don't holler in order to force something to happen. You know, when you pray, and some of us pray, pray more intense than others. That's cool. And when you're praying for somebody who's sick, guys, you want to you wanna push a little bit. But what can happen is as it goes on, if, if you feel like nothing's happening, we feel like we've we got to shout louder. And that, Jesus said that the Pharisees prayed that way because they thought they'd be heard for their many words. Right? You don't need to shout something down. You don't need to hedge your bets. Here's my biggest pet peeve. I'd rather you yell in somebody's ear than say this. And I know I'm going to step on some toes, but let's go for it, okay? And Lord, if you don't heal, that's okay too. Guys, when we're praying for healing, don't say that. Because the person's sitting there with cancer and they're like, uh, no, it's not okay, Lord. Ignore that one, please. Now listen, do we trust God's sovereignty? Yes. But when you're asking for healing, ask for healing. Same thing when you're asking for provision. God gets it. God hears you. God's not going to go, well, you, you didn't say if it was according to my will, so no healing for you. Pray with faith, you guys. More, most of the time when we do that, it's because we lack faith, and we're going to try to make sure this person doesn't feel bad when they inevitably don't get better. Stop that, okay? And as you pray, you should try to discern if this is a natural or a supernatural affliction. Jesus did both. Sometimes Jesus just commanded and spoke healing over a person. Sometimes he cast out a spirit of affliction. He rebuked the spirit of affliction. Listen, this does not mean that a person is possessed. All right? My friends in Nepal, to go back to them, uh, you know, they cast out demons a lot because it's idolatry and it's witchcraft and all this. And my dad asked him one time, he said, so how do you know? Because in America, we debate over this. How do you know if somebody's possessed or not? And they all started laughing. My dad goes, what? What are you laughing for? And they said, oh, you'll know. <laughs> it is unmistakable when somebody is possessed by the devil. However, the devil can bind people up and afflict their body just like he can afflict their mind. Things that I look for is when the sickness stops acting like a sickness. You know, oh man, I've had back pain for 20 years. So we pray for your back. Now my foot hurts. That's not how back pain works, you guys. Or as you know, well, I've got this, you know, I've got this, uh, this cough or I've got this constant thing in my lungs and we pray for that. And it's like, oh, now my head is killing me. My lungs feel better. But guys, that's not how bronchitis works. So that could, could, could be the enemy. In which case you should no longer be praying, Lord, please heal. You say, Lord, rebuke this, this evil spirit. And you should pray you know, and don't, go, don't, don't go in assuming that there's some sort of devilish activity going on, okay? Pastor Thomas just told us this morning, we have the victory, right? There's a, yeah, never mind, I'm not going to tell that story. I'm going to run out of time. After you've prayed a couple times, you know, I usually do like two or three people, ask the person how they feel. Now, oftentimes we're very afraid to do that because now it's real. <laughs> do you feel better? And never make somebody feel like they've got to fake it, you guys. They say, hey, look, do you feel better? Um, you, say, so you don't? You no, know you don't feel better? And I, I don't assume that they don't, but I kind of like to talk like they don't. So that way they feel comfortable to say, no, I don't. And if that's the case, then just pray again. Pray some more. Jesus prayed twice for a blind man. Remember, he laid hands on him and he said, how do you feel? He said, well, I, I see like, people like trees walking. And so Jesus laid hands on him again. Y'all, if Jesus had to pray twice for somebody, we might have to do it a little more often than once. Pray for them. Ask them if they're feeling any different. There are certain phenomena that will take place when you are laying hands on somebody to be healed. Ask them, do you feel, how, what percent better do you feel? I, I like to do that one. Like, well, yeah, 90%. Okay, then you're almost there. Let's pray again. Or, yeah, I don't know, 5%. And that means, okay, nothing's really happened. Let's, let's pray some more, okay? Ask him if it feels worse. This happened to some people where they would bring the young man with epilepsy to Jesus and as soon as he saw him, he fell down on the floor foaming at the mouth. The devil will do this to keep you from being prayed for. We're going to the church to be prayed for tonight. Wow, it's really acting up. I probably shouldn't go. That's of the wicked one. So ask them, do you feel worse? Do you have any new symptoms? I can't remember who this was. I believe this was, uh, this might have been Dakota when we prayed for her, but you know, she said, oh, my joints and my fingers just feel like they're swelling up. Like, well, that has nothing to do with what we're praying for. So that means that there's something happening right now, right? Ask them if the pain is moving. Ask Emily her testimony sometime. That we prayed for her back, that pain had been in the same place for years, and we started chasing it all over her body. It was amazing. 
Ask them if they're in any kind of spiritual distress. Like, you know, you're praying for them, and they were feeling fine other than being sick. Now you start praying for them. Now all of these memories of how their relationship with their dad is in shambles have come to their, their forefront, and they're, they're agonizing in their spirit. That might give you an indication of something that might be blocking the work of the Lord. Some people have mentioned heat when I pray for them. Somebody said, you know when you, pray for pe- when you prayed for me, your hand felt like you were pushing an iron into my back? Like, I did not know that. I've heard lots of people mention we pray for them that they feel like a cold water, like running from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Not me personally. I've heard lots of people say that they feel electricity shoot through their body when people lay hands on them and pray for them. All of those are biblical. Remember when Jesus said, I felt power go out of me that one time? The other one that I've heard, is, uh, heard before is that some of them, well, it felt like something like stabbed into me and then was pulled out. They, those are signs that God is working. Sometimes it's good to let people know about that ahead of time. I'll say, you know, sometimes when I pray for people, they feel like heat or they feel like, you know, a stabbing thing. If you feel that, tell us. So that might mean that God is working, right? Now, if they're not healed or if they're only partially healed, pray again. And at this point, you should trust your gut. And by that, I mean the voice of the Holy Spirit. If something seems right to you in that moment, run with it. You know, words of knowledge that will come. Like, have you... Have you received the forgiveness? I was praying for one man, and after, after a while, I said, are you born again? Hung his head, I don't know. And not only did he get healed, he got saved, right? Trust the Spirit. Like, I, I feel like I ought to lay hands on your head. I'm not going to do that. Do it. Do it. It's the Lord, right? Jesus, remember, Jesus spit and made mud. So the threshold is pretty, for weird, is pretty high, okay? <laughs> don't be afraid sometimes to command healing over a person. You're not commanding God. But Jesus and Peter, and take up your bed and walk. You know, I, I usually don't do that, but there have been times God gives me so much faith where I just go, in Jesus' name, be healed. Boom. Not every time, not most of the time, but sometimes. And there does come a point when the prayer should stop. There comes a point, if you've been praying for a while, and people are getting tired, people are maybe getting, you know, antsy, if the emotions are running really high, then perhaps it's time to take a break and come back. If the person is getting embarrassed, then maybe you should stop. If they're starting to feel like it's their fault that nothing's happening, or if the team is starting to lose it a little bit, sometimes the people you're praying with are they're getting overexcited, and they're starting to get excessive, and I know that this is, going, this is either going to lead to somebody making something up or to somebody getting hurt. Then it's time to stop. We can always pray again. Don't forget that, right? Well, they were only healed 50%. So we'll pray again next time. Say, God, you got more to do here. But if the person feels better, get them to say it. (laughs) Because sometimes we don't want to say it. Because that might, oh, what if I'm wrong, though? Ask them to test it out. If you've been praying for a torn rotator cuff, say, well, I think it feels better. Okay, we'll do this. I don't know if I want to do that. What did Jesus say? Get up your bed and walk, right? And then immediately his, his ankles were strengthened, right? Ask them to to test it out. We're looking for a marker as much as we can that they've been healed so that we can testify. That's the last piece. You got to testify. You got to tell folks, guys. Do you know how many people I've told or talked to? They say, well, yeah, God healed me, but God told me I had to keep that to myself and not tell anybody. Jesus said, don't hide your light under a bushel. The rest of us need your testimony, guys. That's the devil. If he's already lost the battle of you being healed, he's going to try to make sure nobody else knows about it. Tell folks. Talk about it. Hey, you know what Jesus did for me? Well, I don't know if I believe in healing. Oh, I believe in healing. Let me tell you what God did for me. We got to testify. Let the whole world know what God has done. But then this is the the last point I want to look at here. We start to wonder, why are some people not healed? Why are a lot of people not healed? Especially somebody we love. And let's not get this wrong. This hurts When you see other people getting healed and not your son or daughter, not your wife, not your mother or father. And I will just say right up front, we cannot always know why. And in the book of Job especially, we are told to trust that God knows what he's doing even if we don't get it. But there are a few things, even with that said, that the Bible tells us to look for as reasons why a person could not be healed. And some of this might be painful for you to hear, but guys, it's all Bible and we need to receive it. The first reason somebody is not healed, 
simply because they were not prayed for. James 4 verse 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask not. Many times we think prayer would be a good idea and think that's the same thing as actually praying. You've got to actually get on your knees, lay hands on somebody, and pray for them. And maybe they haven't actually received prayer in the way we just described, having the church lay hands on them and pray for them. If you have not asked or not had the elders lay hands on you and anoint you with oil, then you have not done everything the Bible tells you you ought to do in order to seek healing of the body. Number two is a failure of persistence in prayer. You stopped Luke 18.1 tells us Jesus gave a parable that we ought always to pray and never lose heart. Pray and keep on praying and don't stop praying and then pray some more. So, well, if God didn't answer the first time, we shouldn't bother him again. Y'all, that is not biblical. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible tells us to assail heaven with God's promises. Charles Spurgeon uses the analogy of a lawsuit. He says, bring the evidence to God. I said, Lord, you said. No, I don't know if I would do that to God. Man, that's what David did, right? Remember, O oh God. <laughs> the devil will oppose you. This is why we have to persist in prayer. Daniel learned in Daniel chapter 10 that his prayers were hindered for three weeks because there were demon princes fighting the angels that were carrying the answer. This is why we call it spiritual warfare. When you pray for somebody, especially somebody that the devil has bound up, He's going to try to stop you. Now, he can't stop you because you're going to call your big brother Jesus in to beat him up. But you've got to continue to pray. Well, I prayed once. I prayed twice. And I, just, I can't go through that again. Y'all, don't let the devil stop you. The third reason is a lack of faith. Now, I know that this point has often used as a brick bat with which to beat up the sheep. I do not believe that God always heals. I believe God heals way more than we think he does. But it is very true that some people use the lack of faith as an excuse to cover all the failures of their own ministry. But let's leave that aside. Let's look at what the Bible says. It is very true that a lack of faith quenches the Holy Spirit and that there are cases, like Matthew 13, 58, when Jesus was in Nazareth, where God wanted to heal somebody and didn't because they lacked faith. you got to believe. you got to not just believe that God can heal you, but that God will heal you and that he wants to heal you. I'm not talking about some weird positive thinking, we're going to manifest some stuff here. And that's not what this is. What this is, is I believe that there's a God in heaven that heals people, and I believe he loves me and sent his son Jesus to die for me, and I believe that he can and he will, because the Bible tells us to expect this. That's why we're having a teaching like this and why I'm telling so many stories, guys. I'm trying to build your faith. If he did it for her, he can do it for me. If he did it for some Nepali, he can certainly do it for an all-American citizen like me, right? The fourth reason that someone is not healed is because of sin. Not every sickness is a result of sin. Jesus made that abundantly clear in John chapter 9. However, there are some sicknesses that are. There are some people who are sick precisely because of their sin. Even in the Corinthian church, many were sick because of the division and drunkenness and debauchery that was going on at the communion table. You can block the healing that God wants to bring into your life through a lack of of obedience. When Jesus, in John 5, 14, he healed the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. When he saw him again, he goes, now you are healed. Go and sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. Am I going to sit here and say that sickness is always because of sin? No. But sometimes it is. That's why he says in James, confess your sins one to another and you will be healed. Not confess your sins to one another so that I can know your business and pronounce something over you. But because sin is tied to your spirit and the devil holds on to your sin as a hook in your life. This is the invisible world that we don't see, but we have to take the reasons God gives us. And the fifth and final reason that somebody may not be healed is because of God's own sovereignty. God may simply say no. He may have simply chosen not to heal you. Every one of us is going to die eventually. And it's not always an accident. 
Every one of us is going to have the sickness with which we will die, and God will choose not to heal you. And we have to trust that when God says no, that he knows best. Does God teach us things through sickness? Yeah, he does. Does it, I, do we, I think that we could maybe get out of that sickness a little quicker if we get the picture faster? Yeah, I do. But sometimes God simply says no. But what I'm trying to get us to learn today, guys, is not to immediately default to God said no because we prayed one time and nothing happened. Maybe the answer is not yet rather than no. In fact, it's always not yet because when we are in heaven, our body is going to be glorified and there will be no more sickness, no more pain, and no more weeping. And this is what happened to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. He said, To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. God allowed Satan to hurt Paul to keep him from becoming prideful. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ might rest upon me. It is Christ and his gospel that we are after, not merely his mighty works. Don't forget that. However, I believe that God wants to heal more people than are healed right now. I believe that many people find comfort in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 because it liberates them from having to act supernaturally. They can just act like everybody else and have a good biblical reason for it. But do you know that the king Asa was rebuked by the Lord for seeking the physicians rather than God's healing? Do I believe in doctors? Yeah, my sister's a nurse, my brother-in-law is a doctor. We go to the doctor, we have insurance, we do all that, guys. But Jesus is your first stop in that chain. And how many times have you gone to the doctor and they have no clue what's going on with you? You ever been misdiagnosed before? You ever got the wrong medicine before? The psalm tells us to remember his benefits, that he heals all our diseases. We've seen many things through our ministry here as a church. My first healing was for a woman named Pam who was going in for surgery. And uh, she had her pre-op coming up and she said, you know, uh, I, I just, I can't move my neck. I can't sleep. I have to sleep sitting up because my neck hurts so bad I can't move it. We prayed for her and that was going to be it. I said, how do you feel? She goes, that ah, still feels that. I said, let's pray again. And I kind of surprised everybody. We prayed again. I go, how do you feel now? She goes, I don't know. I said, try to move her neck. And she goes, she goes, oh, well, thank you. And that was it. <laughs> and I asked her a week later, so how did your, your meeting go? She goes, oh, I canceled that. <laughs> I feel fine. I remember praying for Emily Gibson. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge beforehand. I've still got it written down. That there's, there's, I mean, somebody we're going to pray for tonight that there's like some sort of movement on somebody's back. And she had pre-arthritis. So you know the story. A doctor told her, you're going to have arthritis by the time you're 30 and it's never going to go away. I'm sorry. And the pain was, was pretty bad. But as we prayed for her, she said, well, it was sitting there and now it's up here. So we prayed, and now it's over here. Now it's in my knee. Now it's in the back of my head. And so we're like, oh, that's not how back pain works. That's not how pre-arthritis works. But we prayed and she began to weep. What is it? It's all gone. The pain's all gone. And she'll still tell you to this day, she feels perfectly fine. That was our first miracle. And I was bouncing up and down, you guys. At our bonfire last, uh, or two years ago, when we had the team come down from Lynchburg, there's a young lady named Hannah. Asked us to pray for her constant migraines. We prayed for her, but as we started praying for her, she starts breaking down crying. And I'm like, what is it? And it comes to find out that she was so... She had not been able to receive the fact that Jesus loved her. What does that have to do with headaches? Well, nothing. But this is what came out as we sought the Lord and began to pray when the Holy Spirit showed up. So we began to speak to her and pray for her that she would receive the love of Jesus. And she did. And when she did, she begins to laugh and to rejoice and smile. And then a few minutes later, well, how's your head? He goes, oh, it's all better. <laughs> the Lord worked out the heart and that dealt with the head, literally the head. We, we told Brandon's story last night. Brandon's doctor thought that he had, uh, what was it, multiple sclerosis, Brandon? All sorts of symptoms that nobody could figure out. The blood work was showing nothing. When we began to pray for him, he said, I felt like I had shackles on my hands and my feet. So Jaron and I were praying for him. We began to rebuke the spirit of affliction. And God gave me a vision. Like Brandon was like, no, this one's fine, this one's fine. Now it's all on this leg. There's a little spot on my leg that just, it feels like all the pain is right there in this one spot. And the Lord gave me a vision of this big, ugly, purple crab-looking thing crouching on his foot. 
And as we were praying, I said, oh, get, get out of here. <laughs> and he said, I feel better. I feel better. And he, st- he still feels better, you guys. The devil had to flee at the name of Jesus. I told you yesterday about Jake at the retreat. Had a tumor in his head. He was going to be going in for cancer surgery. They, the guy's praying, well, we could feel it. He's like, yeah, feel my tumor right here. And he went in for his, his MRI, and there was no tumor. And he goes into the doctor, to, looking at the two different MRI scans. He goes, all I can say is glory to God. You can go home now. And I told you, when I was in Peru, there was one night where God healed nine different people, including cancer, chronic neck pain, and kidney failure. Three different times when I laid hands on some of those people, they flinched because they said it felt like somebody stuck a hot dagger in my, in my body and pulled it out. And when it came out, all the pain went with it. There was a woman, I just, you know, very, she was sitting in the chair, lightly laid my hands on her kidneys like this. Barely touched her because I didn't want to be inappropriate, right? But she jerks back like this and started to cry. Because she said it, was, it all left in an instant when you did that. One lady, when we laid hands on her, said she felt one of her vertebrae snap into place. Well, the click in her neck and all the pain in her head and her shoulders and her back is all gone. I never experienced that before, and I wasn't doing nothing different than I've ever done before. Lord Jesus, please heal this person. They go, wow, what'd you do? Not a thing. But my God is mighty to save and mighty to heal, isn't he? You guys, God is still at work in the world. He's not done yet. And he desires to do his mighty works both in your life and through you. The healer's in the room. Let's believe him. If there's one thing I can have you take away from this today is to get excited about the fact that Jesus heals the body and more excited about it than you are skeptical about it. Can we at least agree on that?